Hey everyone, my name is John Latoski, and this is my boss actually from IOHK, Samuel Leathers. And we're going to talk today about a NixOps plugin architecture. And Sam is just going to give an introduction to uh, what we're about to talk about today. So I want to tell you guys a little bit of a story here. This story goes all the way back to uh, 2016 of December when someone opened this issue to support Volter and NixOps. And this is still not addressed yet at this point. So uh, fast forward to May of 2017, and uh, I actually implemented it. I got it working. Everything works. I still use it today. It wasn't implemented the best. It doesn't have tests. The documentation was pretty shoddy, but it works. And once it worked, I was like, OK, it works for me. Good enough. I'm not going to push to try to get it in. But I've been rebasing this on master and dealing with merge conflicts for a few years now, keeping my system up. And I think one other person might be using this fork of uh, NixOps that I have as well that uh, has commented on it in IRC before. Um, so it's not heavily utilized, but it's really a pain managing this. Fast forward to last year, um, IOHK decided we wanted to add packet.net support to NixOps, which uh, was great, except for we did the same thing. We forked NixOps, we started working on it, we never quite got it to stable where we wanted, and we've been dealing with lots of merge conflicts since we wrote that little piece of code. And it was painful, and uh, then uh, Graham Christensen uh, approached me and was basically like, hey, I got this PR I opened on uh, NixOps plugin architecture. Is this something you're interested in? I'm like, I think IOHK can definitely help out with this. So I did what every good manager does, and I hired someone and told that person, your first task is to figure out how to do this. So here he is. <laughs> Thank you. OK, so uh, we'll just go through some of the basics here to start with. So. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, NixOps is a tool for deploying sets of NixOps Linux machines, either to real hardware or virtual machines. And it extends NixOps's declarative approach to system configuration management to networks and adds provisioning. And as Sam just mentioned, uh, we're using it quite extensively at IOHK. <coughs> so from straight out of the NixOps uh, user guide, if we just take a look at that, we can see that uh, NixOps does support a number of infrastructure provider resources and other resource types uh, throughout the lifetime of NixOps. And some of them are like cloud providers, AWS, GCE, Azure, Hetzner, virtualized infrastructure such as VirtualBox, LibVirt, QEMU, and metrics resources such as Datadog. And providing functionality and support for each of the numerous resource types above has led to a fairly large monolithic GitHub repository. So if we look historically at some of the stats, uh, we see that in about 2016, it looks like uh, the lines added and the commit count started trending down a little bit. And similarly, we can see that with the lines diff and lines deleted as well. And some of the thoughts in the community as of roughly mid-2018 uh, could be summarized as a majority of those at the time, ar around mid-2018, were for PRs, or of the PRs, were for providers. And uh, PRs to NixOps uh, were very slow to merge because while it's super important that they work, are stable, and don't break anything else because users depend on it. And for a lot of the providers, people don't really know how they work or interact with other stuff. And it's hard to know how to add a new provider because everything is so tangled together. So. It's really hard to add a new provider because it has to be in core, and Sam's earlier introduction kind of speaks to that. So as a demo, uh, we'll just look at what a very simple deployment is going to uh, the monolithic version of NixOps from the past. And this is pre-recorded, so we don't have any uh, unforeseen delays. Um, but basically, we'll install this imperatively. And we'll install NixOps 1.7, just with NixEnv. I can make it larger. It uh, probably wrap a lot of lines. Is that better? So we can look at the deployment file. And you can split up your deployment files into a logical file and a physical file. Here, because this is very simple, it's just both 
the logical aspect, which is the software we're deploying is just Nginx with an index.html, that's custom, and then the physical deployment type of VirtualBox, it's just in one file. And then we create a deployment with that, and the VirtualBox plugin doesn't yet have an image in 1909, so we're gonna fix the channel to 1903. We create the deployment, give it a name, now we check for deployments again, and we see that a deployment is there, it doesn't yet have a description, and the machines show zero. But now that it's there, we can deploy the deployment, and NixOps will build the machine locally, then it will copy the path. And it brings a virtual machine up, attaches the disk, waits for networking to come online. And this doesn't take too long. <laughs> so it gets a network IP and starts copying the closure over to the machine. And this will take probably 20 or 30 seconds. So while we're waiting, could I see a show of hands for those who have not used NixOps or are not familiar with NixOps? Okay, so good number of people. And it's just about done. So it's copying the rest of the closure over. In a moment, it will restart services on the target virtual machine that is running on localhost. And now the deployment is finished, and we can get information about the deployment. And now we see that there is one machine, it has an IP, there's also a network description, NixOps 1.7 monolithic demo. And to verify that the machine is up, we can curl Nginx at the IP and see the hello NixCon 2019. So that's kind of how the uh, monolithic version of NixOps uh, was functioning. So given that we saw the commits going down and the feeling was, you know, there was kind of some um, blockage in being able to make commits to NixOps, uh, a migration to plugin architecture was considered and it was considered that it may solve these issues. Of course, it might add some additional complexities that would need to be addressed, um, but it also had potential to open up functionality further in, in NixOps, such as adding other language support uh, via plugin RPC. And uh, Graham did the initial proof of concept uh, branch back in mid-2018. And uh, he demonstrated basically a NixOps core repo with just about everything stripped out of it as far as the functionality for providers go. And then a separate standalone AWS plugin repo. And Graham's initial proof of concept utilized Pluggy, which is a popular, flexible, extensible Python plugin system. Uh, to bring NixOps core and uh, the plugin repos together. Um, Pluggy was kind of the perfect thing, and as it says right here, which is straight out of the Pluggy Read the Docs, it gives users the ability to extend or modify the behavior of a host program by installing a plugin for that program. The plugin will run as a part of a normal program execution, changing or enhancing certain aspects of it. So this kind of seemed like the perfect fit, and we just continued forward with using Pluggy. Uh, just from a very high level, uh, some of the common elements in each plugin repo that would uh, be created as it's split out from NixOps core. Um, there is, in its own plugin repo, a file setup.py, and that describes the initial plugin entry points and the packages are defined there. Uh, there's also a NixOps plugin directory, so it would be like NixOps VBox or NixOps AWS with a pluggy.py file, and that defines the 
uh, API hooks of Pluggy, essentially. And as of right now, we're utilizing just three hooks. And that's a load hook, uh, which will return a list of the plugin Python modules from the plugin to get loaded into Nix Ops Core. Uh, Nix Expressions hook, which will tell Core what Nix Expressions need to be loaded in to be functional. And a parser, which is used to pass the arg parse um, functionality of Python over to the plugins so that the command line can be extended out into the plugins. And this might be a little hard to see, but we'll, we'll look at it again. It's just included as an example. And this is the uh, plugin.py file for the NixOps packet plugin repo. And it just shows we have our three hooks in this one file, uh, the Nix expressions hook, uh, the, the plugins hook, which shows there's, we want to load four modules in, and then a parser hook implementation so we can extend uh, the NixOps packet out with a CLI hook. So the initial approach taken uh, for packaging and updating plugins with NixOps core was to be similar to what we see with the Terraform providers uh, approach in Nix packages. And uh, Terraform Providers uh, utilizes three files, data.nix, providers.nix, and an update all script. And essentially, the data.nix is just, um, it's an attribute set that forms uh, fetch from GitHub attributes. And um, the providers contains a list of repos and uh, the, the GitHub user for those repos. And the update all script just gets run and it can update then that attribute set that's in data.nix. So for the main PR that converted the NixOps core uh, repo from monolithic to plugin, that was PR 1179. And uh, a follow-on PR uh, 1198 uh, implemented this approach. And, it, and it's almost identical. It's just a little bit different with the file names. And the, the bash script got cleaned up a little bit to be a little bit more flexible. So. This will be a demo of the new approach, and we'll show how to basically do a deployment with VirtualBox like we just did, except with the plugins. And we'll give an example of how we use that update all script and do a local build to get NixOps with those plugins. So first, we'll uninstall the NixOps we installed before imperatively. And this plugin version of NixOps is not yet incorporated into the unstable channel. So we'll have to pull it from uh, Hydra as a master tarball, or we can just git clone the repository right now. So we'll do the latter, just git clone. CD into the directory. We'll fetch the PR, which really all this extra PR does uh, that is currently unmerged is just add some extra documentation and it cleans up the script so we don't have to have a GitHub API token here right now. So now from the source that exists in this GitHub repo, we can immediately build the NixOps plugins that are already in the data.nix file. And these are the AWS and Hetzner plugins. And we can see their uh, fetch from GitHub attributes right here. So to build with one or both of these plugins, we could just look at the readme. And there's a few different ways we can build it in roughly the middle of the screen. We can do a fairly typical Nix build, and there's an extra argument that takes a parameter P, and we can specify what the plugin is. Alternatively, we can do a dev shell build, which essentially builds the software and drops us into a Nix shell, and we can just specify on the command line what we want. And if we want to iterate quickly then by having another local plugin package and exit the shell and re-enter with a new build, we can do that pretty quickly that way. So we'll, we'll just do a build with the AWS plugin in a dev shell. And there's the command at the bottom. And uh, typically, there's quite a bit more output, uh, maybe five pages, and it takes 10, 10, or 10 seconds or so. Uh, I've, I've pre-built this previously, so we don't have a whole lot of output here. But now, uh, NixOps shows a new command. At the bottom, there is a list plugins command, which is not in the monolithic NixOps version. And if we list plugins, we can see that the AWS plugin is installed. Or we can look at a more verbose option, which shows where that plugin is stored in the Nix store. So we could now deploy an AWS instance 
Uh, but what about the VBox uh, plugin that we installed before? So we, if we'd like to do that, how do we do that? Because it's not in the data.next file. So we could certainly populate it manually, but more preferably, we'd like to use the what's already here, which is the all plugins.txt file and the update all scripts. So if we look at the update or the all plugins, we see that there's uh, just two entries, which is for the AWS and the Hetzner, and we already have those plugins. So we can add the VirtualBox plugin to this, to the all plugins.txt file, just using the GitHub user and, and repo uh, format. So we'll add that line to that file. It's there now. And then we'll run the update all script. And what it does is it reaches out to each of the repos and looks for the latest release tag, and then generates the fetch from GitHub attributes for that and sticks it in the da a new data.next file. So that's complete, and if we take a look at the data.next file, it's now updated at the bottom with the VBox fetch from GitHub attribute. So similar to before, we can now build this with both the AWS and VBox plugins. We'll exit the dev shell and then reissue the similar command, this time just with the extra VBox plugin. And if we list plugins, we now see we have VBox support. So now we can do a quick deploy. It's the same steps as before. So we just create the deployment, and I believe this won't take as long. And since it's pretty much exactly the same as what we saw the first time, we probably don't need to sit through and wait and see the end here. Uh, but it's going to deploy exactly the same way. The only real difference is that this repository is now uh, built using plugins rather than the monolithic repo. So I will just... Well, let's see, it's almost done. So now that it's deployed, similar to before, we'll get information about the repo. We see it's at a different IP address, and we'll just curl it, make sure it's operational. And now we see, yes, it says, hello, NixCon 2019 from a plugin deploy. So some drawbacks to this update all method, well, it's a mix of manual intervention with bash and Nix, so it's not really that ideal. Also, it just pulls from the latest tag commit in those repos to build that data.nix file. So if you want to do something like uh, build from a specific branch or a specific commit, um, you know, it's not that flexible. So there's another approach that we've taken that we're using at IOHK, and that's to use a dependency manager. And just one example is NIV, using NIV to pin different sources. So this may also be a little bit difficult to see at the back. Um, I can expand it in a few minutes in the command console. Um, but essentially, we have a default.nix file, which uh, we can uh, specify an overlay for nix packages, and we're going to make nix ops one of the overlay packages in there. And we specify the p, p parameter, just like we did on the command line. Uh, but here, we can specify plugin sources, such as nixop packet, and we can declare this to be any commit or any branch in that repo. We can also have a local GitHub repo that's not checked in anywhere, but it's just local, and hack on that and specify that to be built from a local source. And additionally, anything that is in data.nix, originally that we could just build from the command line like that, we can still put it in as the p parameter down here in the list. So this is a little more flexible of an approach. Um, additionally, what this next demo will show taking that approach and using NIV, but we'll also show how you can extend the command line. Uh, for instance, using packets SOS console, which is um, 
serial over SSH so you have out of band management for your servers if your network goes down or you need that for some other reason. And I'll try to make this a little bigger. Oops. And one of the other things we're doing in this demo here is we're using Durenv. So when we enter into the deployment directory, we can automatically have NixOps built through a Nix shell, because uh, NixOps is one of the dependencies of that Nix shell, uh, as well as Niv itself. And in this directory, we have default.nix. We have a Nix directory that has the Niv sources that are pinned, and we'll look at those in a second. We have a packet plugin.nix, which is the deployment file that specifies the server to build. A shell.nix that pulls in the NIV dependency and the NixOps dependency. And then also the local NixOps VBox in case we wanted to uh, pull that in as well. In the Nix directory, we have the NIV pins, sources.json and sources.nix, a default.nix, and there's an unrelated uh, file in here, packages.nix. So for the packet deployment, this is really only a physical spec. There's nothing in here that's doing any logical uh, deployment of software or anything else. Um, this has already been spun up prior to this demo, and the reason is basically you just wanna show that the machine is up and show some new command line features that are part of NixOps using that command line enhancement hook. So to see what the NIV source pins are currently set to, we can look at the Nix sources file. And it's a little off the screen because uh, my font is big here, but you can see we're pinning the Nix ops repo to a specific branch at a specific revision, and also doing that for Nix packages. Uh, NIV is up above, and also Nix ops core, uh, we're using a fork uh, actually pinned to a specific branch and commit as well. And as we saw in the slide that was smaller than this earlier, the uh, NixOps is defined as an overlay uh, using those different types of sources, one being the NIV source, another being a local source, and the final one being the data.nix source. So now we'll enable durenv so that we can just, it'll drop us into a NixOps shell with NixOps in the path. And we can list the plugins. And we see that we have the AWS packet and VBox plugin that we had wanted and defined in the default.nix. And if we list deployments, we see there is one machine there that's a packet machine and was pre-deployed prior to this demo being recorded. And there's a packet machine with the packet key pair that's needed to SSH into it. And now, if we just tail the NixOps help, we do see that there is a new command in the NixOps command structure, and that's the packet command to run packet-specific plugin commands. So we get a little more help on that. We see it has some structure. We gotta do NixOps packet SOS console to connect to a machine's SOS console, and takes a few additional parameters like the deployment and the machine name. So we'll just try it out. This is the demo three deployment on packet one. And you can see we have a login prompt, and this is connected with out-of-band management, so even if the networking's down, we can still get access immediately. And you could do this outside of NixOps. You can SSH to a specific uh, 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 URL or a fully qualified domain name, and you'll get access, but this is just much more convenient. You can issue this command simply, and it shows that really any plugins that are made can extend out the capability of NixOps through the command line as well. All right, that's the end of that demo. So just to summarize, the work involved in changing over to a plugin architecture from monolithic was Graham's initial POC around uh, mid-2018. Um, the, the big PR that did the migration was in September 19. There's another PR uh, that's unmerged that just does some script and documentation improvements. Uh, and then most recently, uh, Elko uh, has uh, put a PR up that's unmerged. It's really just a few days old, I think, that moves to flakes. So. Um, that looks to me probably the way we'll be going in the future is uh, bring all these plugins together with flakes. 
So here's a little merge drama. When that uh, plugin architecture uh, PR merged, there was a whole lot of lines deleted. It's a little exaggerated here because uh, it's double counting the lines, actually. It's really just 32,000 lines we deleted from the core. And so the actual plugins that are out there right now, you can see them on the screen. There's quite a few of them. Some of them are hosted on, uh, by the Nix OS work. Some of them are hosted at Nix community. And there's a few third-party hosted uh, repos as well. And I actually forgot to put my boss's uh, Vulture repo on there that he just mentioned earlier. So sorry about that. <laughs> and the future is probably, as I mentioned, with Flakes. I look forward to uh, learning how to use that. And some possibilities that we can do uh, with the plugin structure is to extend uh, NixOps capabilities uh, with RPC or maybe more generally IPC to interface with other languages through a plugin or to bridge to other services. And there's still quite a bit to work to do. At a minimum, uh, the, the, the testing libraries are not really cleaned up right now. Probably need to migrate the testing libraries to each of the plugins. I think a number of them are still left in the core. And of course, we need more documentation for everything. So thank you to everyone in the community for helping make this happen. Uh, the community members who helped with the POC, the merge, and uh, moving a number of these plugins over. Elko, of course, for his contributions and moving it forward with Flakes. And uh, IOHK and my boss for giving time to do this. And all other contributors who are helping out. Questions? Hi, uh, great talk. Uh, just to be clear, you don't actually have to change anything in your like NixOps uh, deployment configurations to use. Like this doesn't change your Nix files. That no, it does not change your Nix files. So basically, your deployment is going to be exactly the same unless your plugin has new changes in it and whatnot. But that would be the same if it was in core and merged in there. Uh, this basically gives. Uh, plugin providers and people that want to write non-provider related plugins, like one thought we had was like a, a DNS generic backend that could tie into like AWS Route 53 and Cloudflare DNS that you could basically offload your DNS to multiple things. If someone wanted to do that, they could start taking advantage of this, put that plugin into um, their own repo, test it, have some other people play around with it, and then eventually, once there's enough people use it, move it into Nix community, and if it has massive adoption, like AWS, it becomes adopted in the Nix OS org completely, and the Nix OS org completely. So we, we broke it down into three layers, the Nix OS org, Nix community, and then other forks, and basically the Nix OS org ones have ultimate support. We're never gonna break those. The Nix community ones might break from version to version. It's dependent on the community members to keep those up to date. Um, and then the ones in forks are not gonna be really tested at all by any one maintaining core. Anyone hey. else? Yeah, here, here, here. Um, yeah, here. Can you see me? Yep. Okay. <laughs> uh, I was wondering if, like, I think uh, the issues that were on the NixOps repo that related related to some of the of the pl plugins were not migrated to their respective repos, were they? No, they have not been migrated. That's kind of a manual process to migrate them. We did c uh, migrate the commit history. Um, so we didn't lose any commit history for any changes, but specific issues and PRs and whatnot were not migrated, and it's up to the maintainers of those plugins to move those issues. And if new ones are opened, we're just going to uh, probably leave a note in there, please use this repo instead and close it right away. Uh, a lot of cleanup hasn't been done on the repo. Like you saw, my Volter one is still in there. That one should really be closed because it doesn't apply anymore. Um, and if anyone wants to, especially if you're not very technical and you want to help contribute to NixOps, we would love people to just go through triage issues and help move that. Maybe that might be a good event for the hack day on Sunday. Over there. Yeah, so I think having the plugins is great, so thanks for that. Um, I, I think the only drawback as a contributor is that if it's possible that people write against the NixOps code um, or core code uh, in some separate repositories. As a contributor, I may now be able to break 
much more, many more people's stuff because I may not know that their plugin exists, right? What is your recommended approach to like communicating uh, plugins? Let's say somebody else makes some plugin and I as another contributor want to make sure I don't break their stuff. Before, because everything was in one repo, I could just see, okay, these are the, I don't know, five providers we have so I can manually test those. Um, is there like one place where all of them should be registered? I can imagine that in Nix packages itself, because the plugins are listed there, that might be one place to look. But for example, plugins currently being in development or what, that may be affected by some change of API or what. Where should we best communicate or where should everybody announce their plugins? Do we have like, is there a place we should put that in? Well, ideally, if you're um, using uh, NixOps and you have a community around you using that plugin, it should go in the Nix community rather than in your personal fork, mm -hmm. which will get a little bit more support because you have more community people testing it, reporting issues with breakages. Um, second to that, I think a huge important thing we need to do is um, have a versioning system that basically when we break APIs of how those plugins integrate with NixOps, because there's still going to be work that needs done on core, like this DNS thing I was talking about. That's going to have to have a core change to it to be able to support having uh, DNS entries automatically added across a variety of different plugins with different backends. So um, as things like that are done on core, if they're additive, it doesn't really matter. We don't need to worry about announcing it as a breaking change. But if it's something that changes the way something was done before, either optimizes something that we know is going to break a lot of plugins, um, it needs to be communicated in some release notes in NixOps, and it really shouldn't go into a stable release until we have some release notes available for those changes. And the second question that maybe you cannot answer directly, but I just wanted to surely bring up is one thing that traditionally has been difficult with NixOps is testing it with the actual real providers. For example, if I make a Hetzner PR, like Aslik wants to test it, for example, he needs an actual Hetzner machine to test it. Maybe at some point in the future we can make, perhaps as part of this community repo or what, some way that we provide some infrastructure that things actually get tested at upstream providers. For example, asking them for like a free account or something like this that we can use for a continuous integration. Maybe not a question for you, but like as a community, that would be like really good to have for NixOps in the future. Well, one of those providers is uh, here at this conference. Uh, Packet.net sent someone here, so if that's something you're interested in, I would highly recommend you talk to him. Um, as for other providers, I mean, yeah, we need to have these communications with them. It's going to be hard to get some kind of buy-in from like AWS to do something like this, but more of the more community-oriented ones, I'm sure, are going to be happy to provide some resources. And Packet.net already provides a number of resources to the Nix community already, so big thank you to them for that. Uh, we have a question by Anders on ISC. Is anybody working on a VMware backend for NixOps currently? I can't hear the question. Uh, is anybody working on a VMware backend currently? Uh, you want a VMware, VMware backend? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't know of anyone working on a VMware backend, so as far as I'm aware, I no, I don't think so. I have a question about actually using NixOps. So last I checked, it stores all of its state information about the cluster in a local SQLite database, which is fine if you just have one developer provisioning the cluster. But how do you handle this in an enterprise environment with a shared team? So uh, we basically, it's really the only way to do it right now. It's not ideal, but we utilize shared deployers where basically multiple people can log into it and they have read-write access to that state and there's some kind of communication on a back channel basically saying, hey, I'm touching this right now. Uh, don't touch it or whatnot. Do you have any plans or do you think it would be particularly hard to implement like an S3 backend for the state or various other backends, like a Postgres background? Yeah, I'm not sure if anyone started working on that. That would definitely be something that IOHK would be very interested in and if we have some time to find a good pet project to do for Nix next year. Maybe that will be something we work on. Um, but I'm not aware of anyone currently working on that. If anyone else is here, please let me know. Okay. 
Okay. Is that everyone? Okay. Thanks, all. Thank you. Thank you.